Okay, thank you uh, very much. It's uh, nice to be in this particularly big uh, and beautiful room, uh, even though I'm further away from you, but I hope that uh, it doesn't uh, stop us from interacting uh, in the same way. So as yesterday, uh, please, uh, if you have questions uh, or thoughts uh, while I'm talking, just raise your hand, uh, and uh, I think that will be good for all of us. Uh, I, f I find it more exhausting to speak in a continuous long monologue than in some kind of uh, interaction. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, today the topic uh, is uh, words, and I will probably uh, only talk about words uh, as such in the word classes. That's also on the handout. You see the handout is very long. Uh, somehow I thought that I could put both into one lecture, but probably that won't work uh, well. We will see. Um, so the main uh, message uh, today is that the notion of word is uh, very problematic, uh, and uh, the one thing uh, that you should take home from this lecture is that whenever you hear a linguist using the notion of word, uh, then ask, well, what exactly do you mean? Uh, how do you define the word? Uh, is the word really something uh, that is well understood? Because, of course, words, uh, you know, word is an everyday notion, much more so than uh, even sentence. Um, and so we might think that just because we talk about words all the time, uh, words are a necessary ingredient in linguistics. Uh, but I think they aren't. We can do uh, very sophisticated linguistics without having a notion um, word, um, and uh, we shouldn't simply presuppose that just because everybody talks about words that they must exist. I mean, for a long time um, I did so. So in 2002 I wrote a textbook, Morphology, and like everyone else I assumed that there was such a thing as word and such a thing as morphology, right? Morphology uh, is uh, the study of the internal structure of words, whereas syntax is the study of the combination of words, right? That's what everybody knows, uh, but what exactly is the borderline between syntax and morphology. You know, at the time I wasn't quite sure, but I thought, well, there must be a borderline somehow, and uh, there must be a justification for having morphology and syntax in uh, several domains. But nowadays I don't think so anymore, because I searched very hard and I, I couldn't find anything. Um, and so I will uh, uh, talk about this. So you may uh, remember that yesterday I talked about uh, this non a prioristic approach, uh, where we have observation, comparison, and explanation. And the description and analysis is kind of more language particular, and it's not really necessary for um, <clears throat> understanding the nature of human language, whereas in the restrictivist view, uh, you have analysis and comparison uh, the same. And for the restrictivist, there's an a priori restrictive framework. So uh, this idea that all languages have words in the same sense, you know, if words are uh, part of this innate uh, framework, that's quite natural on the restrictivist view. Um, so, you know, if children are born with a system where words uh, are, you know, part of what they expect to find, you know, then they will just listen, and when they have enough evidence, they will say, okay, so that's a word. So, um, whereas for the non a priorist, uh, the word is not needed, and you may have noted uh, or well, probably not, but in yesterday's talks, uh, I didn't make crucial use of the notion of word. So I explained all kinds of things, you know, but I talked, for example, about degree of coding. Uh, you know, there was no word there. You know, also, you know, whether something is an affix uh, or a separate word, you may remember I said, uh, sometimes it's unclear whether something is a case suffix or a postposition. So I just call it a flag. Um, so, in many cases, the distinction between the traditional distinction between words and affixes is totally irrelevant. And uh, in order to understand languages, uh, other uh, concepts um, are more important. Okay, so the starting point here the question is is the word, is morphology a concept of general linguistics? Um, of course, morphology is defined by the notion of word. Um, if we assume that language in general makes a morphology syntax distinction, we must have good reasons for assuming that there's a general word notion. But 
do we have these good reasons? Does Czech have words in the same sense as English uh, or Chinese? Well, as I said, uh, linguists usually assume that this is the case. Uh, and uh, they sometimes make generalizations about words, such as all languages have words, or claims about general preferences for suffixes versus prefixes, right? That presupposes that we know uh, that something uh, is a prefix rather than a, a separate word preceding the main word, um, or a suffix. Uh, claims about the nature of Creole languages, so for example, McWhorter, he referred to the lack of inflectional morphology in Creole languages. Now, Creole languages do have a lot of tense aspect, uh, tense aspect marking, but is it morphological marking? Or is it marking by some kind of separate particles? You know, he isn't clear about that. Then, you know, people make claims about variable complexity of language structure. So, you know, languages that have a lot of morphological marking are said to be complex. But then, you know, some languages have marking, for example, tense, uh, aspect, uh, modality, or, you know, some kind of um, at positional marking, don't these count just because they're separate words? And how do we know whether they're separate words or not? So, so there are all kinds of claims which I think are very problematic because these people, uh, they just assume that words exist and this assumption, um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to make it. So it's generally presupposes being evidently true. Now what happens if it isn't evidently true, then all these things have to be rethought. And that's going to be quite a bit of work uh, for the discipline of linguistics, I think. I mean, I've started uh, this. I hope others uh, uh, will join me. And to some extent, it's already happening. Um, I will talk about this briefly uh, soon. Okay, just uh, one more thing about general, uh, generative linguistics. In the uh, 1980s and 1990s, there was a widespread movement, the so-called lexicalist uh, movement. So there was a very explicit claim, uh, so not just the presupposition uh, that you have words, that morphology and syntax are separate, but the explicit claim that morphology and syntax are separate. So something like the generalized lexicalist hypothesis, no syntactic rule can refer to elements of morphological structure, or the word structure autonomy condition, or the lexicalist hypothesis of Anderson, the syntax neither manipulates nor has access to the internal structure of words. Uh, so in these works, uh, this general idea was perhaps the most explicit. And it's interesting to note that lexicalism uh, has sort of disappeared from mainstream um, generative grammar. So these, these authors, Anderson, Selkirk, and Lapointe, were quite mainstream in the 1980s and 1990s, but the mainstream view nowadays is that there is no syntax morphology um, distinction uh, according to the minimalist program and the mainstream uh, view in morphology is uh, distributed morphology, um, which um, also says that there is no distinction. But strangely, it's still called distributed morphology. And the main paper, or the kind of most widely quoted, is called something like the syntax morphology interface. You know, as if still syntax and morphology were separate. So uh, people are not, still not drawing the conclusion that there's just one domain, perhaps, to be called morphosyntax or so. So if you uh, look at, uh, you know, some of the textbooks, uh, you will actually find that People who have taken a closer look have long been aware that there's a big problem. So yes, percent. What's the word? What is one word? These are very difficult problems. Um, Lanaker, the word is a difficult notion to define. Well, then he spends 25 pages uh, trying to define it. Uh, but that was sort of the last uh, thing. So during the structuralist period, around the middle of the 20th century, uh, many linguists worried about how to define word. And then Lanaker, 72, was the last. And after 1972, people, you know, just assumed that there was such a thing uh, as a word, or they assumed that such a thing um, didn't exist. So I took a, a closer look again and really didn't find a good uh, justification. Actually, my favorite statement is Matthew's. It's a morphology textbook. There have been many definitions of the word, and if any had been successful, I would have given it long ago instead of dodging the issue until now. So he really admits it in the textbook. 
in, in my morphology textbook, I did more or less the same. You know, in the first chapter, I said, okay, let's assume that there's a thing such as words, so then we can define morphology as follows. And then it was only in chapter eight that I tried to define the word. Uh, and similarly, Matthews, only on page 208, uh, says something about how to define the word. Um, so, um, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't write a morphology textbook anymore. The publisher keeps asking me for a revised version um, because they want to sell it. Um, <laughs> uh, I think it's, a, it's really a problem. Okay, so the central claim here is linguists have no good basis for identifying words across languages, hence no good basis for a general distinction between syntax and morphology as parts of the language system. I mean, of course, we can colloquially talk about syntax versus morphology, but we shouldn't use it uh, in any of our claims. Uh, so I, I think it's okay to continue to have morphology conferences or uh, introduction to morphology, but you shouldn't think that somehow morphology is a different domain uh, from syntax until somebody uh, you know, makes this argument. Very few people uh, have made the argument. So, so how could we define a word? Um, I distinguish first four potential kinds of word-defining properties, semantic, orthographic, phonological, and morphosyntactic. And I'll just treat the first three very briefly and then focus on the morphosyntactic words. So, um, or maybe just intuitions. Some people have said the notion of word is intuitively given. So you can, you can just ask speakers, what are the words? What are the word boundaries? You know, when I write your language down, where should I start a new word? Uh, so, you know, sometimes I, you know, I ask my um, fellow linguists who are field workers, you know, you know, go to describe, you go to the field and describe a language that's not written. Um, so the, my favorite answer was by uh, um, uh, Andrei Kibrik, a Russian linguist who worked on the language of Alaska. So do your speakers have intuitions about how to separate words, I asked him. He said, yes, they do have intuitions, but the problem is different speakers have very different intuitions. <laughs> so, so they think that, yes, of course, their language is, you know, like English, you know, it has words, it, it has, you write it with spaces in between, uh, but they cannot agree on where to put the spaces. Uh, so this is something that's reported again and again. Of course, some people also say, no, the speakers have very clear intuitions. Um, so, you know, it may depend on the language. In some languages, speakers actually may have similar um, intuitions on where to put the spaces. But very often, they are, uh, I mean, certainly, uh, I don't have intuitions where to put spaces in German words that are independent uh, of uh, what I've learned about writing. So you really have to, to ask people uh, who either don't know how to write or who... Uh, uh, write only in some other language, and then often um, you know, they have totally different views. Well, semantic non-compositionality, I think we can leave that right away. We all know that um, there are many uh, larger uh, expressions um, that are non-compositional idiomatic expressions like spill the beans, or and also a lot of words are compositional. So the the issue of semantic compositionality is quite separate from what's a word or not. I mean, there's some correlation perhaps, but there's no semantic uh, notion of word. Well, orthographically, of course, the word is very salient. The word is something that comes between spaces. We can all agree on that, so it's clear what's an orthographic word, but uh, that's not universal. Many orthographies don't use spaces, Chinese, Japanese, um, Sanskrit, also in the European languages, word spacing is an innovation. Until about a thousand years ago, the scriptio continua was the norm in Western writing. Um, and I, I'm still looking for uh, a good account of uh, how it came about that people started putting word boundaries and what the models were. So when people uh, first uh, you know, wrote down some of the European languages, like English, for example. I think in old English manuscripts, you didn't have word separation, um, or at least not in the earliest ones. But actually, for most old English texts, we only have the later texts. So maybe the word separation then came in the later manuscripts or so. Um, I don't know. You know, wh whose idea was it? How did it spread? 
Um, so, you know, if you have any knowledge uh, about this, um, you know, uh, what about uh, Old Church Slavonic, for example? Is there uh, word separation there or so? I don't know. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> many languages also have obvious inconsistencies in the spelling rule. So, in, uh, in German, the infinitive marker zu is sometimes spelled as a prefix, jointly with a verb stem, and sometimes spelled um, separately. So the reason for that is really quite idiosyncratic and has nothing to do with the language structure. Okay, so then people often try to define the word phonologically, um, but uh, by now everyone seems to agree that phonological words and morphosyntactic words very often don't agree with each other. So these are different notions. So we cannot say that there's a monolithic concept of word in a language uh, because the phonological and the other criteria often diverge. Uh, but also now within the phonological words, the criteria often diverge. And my claim is that within the morphosyntactic words, the criteria diverge. So if the criteria don't match, we end up having various domains depending on the criteria but we don't really have um, a single morphological, no, morphosyntactic word. People have also called this grammatical word or morphological word or syntactic word or word form or morphosyntactic word. So these, it seems to all refer to the same concept, the idea that there is some cohesion of uh, the morphs of the uh, minimal form meaning pairs uh, that is, uh, gives us a grammatical domain, non-phonological grammatical domain that's uh, independent of sentence structure. So the, these people have used this term and, and I'm going to use morphosyntactic word and going to try to find some morphosyntactic word criteria. So now that we know that there's no intuitions, that the semantic criteria don't work, uh, that orthographic criteria uh, of course don't work and that um, the phonological criteria are also known to be separate from the morphosyntactic criteria. So, um, well, what about potential pauses? That's, this is also sometimes um, mentioned, uh, you know, analogous to the space that you have in writing. Uh, you know, I think naive uh, people think uh, that we make a pause between every two words. Right? I mean, that's logical because when you write, you see the break between the words, but actually in actual speech, there, there are no pauses. It's just one word after the other. Of course, you, make an, you, you can make pauses um, sometimes, and so the idea is when you can make a pause, uh, that's a word. But this criterion is not necessary. Clitics are generally considered words, but no pause is possible between a clitic and its host. And the criterion is not sufficient because some languages allow pauses in the middle of a word. Um, so, in, uh, there's a paper by uh, Evans et al. from 2008 on some northern Australian polysynthetic languages uh, where they explicitly say, yeah, the speakers can say kah, rak, mian, he will get firewood, but the linguists still say that this is a single word. And now, th this is somewhat unusual. Um, perhaps, um, but um, in any event, uh, uh, the possibility of pauses is not something uh, that's really part of the language system, right? I mean, you can't really, um, yeah, I mean, can you ask speakers, is a pause acceptable here? Maybe you can. Anyway, according to Dixon and Eichenwald, the possibility of pausing may be more closely related to phonological wordhood and to morphosyntactic wordhood. So it's not, a, it's not really a morphosyntactic criterion, but I wanted to mention it somewhere. Um, so I mentioned it here at the beginning. Perhaps the best known uh, definition of the morphosyntactic word is by Bloomfield, uh, because his 19, uh, 1933 book uh, was very widely used uh, as a linguistics book and a textbook for students in the United States. So uh, lots of people read it and were influenced by it. Uh, now, Bloomfield had a notion of a free forms, um, that is, utterance segments that can occur on their own as a complete utterance. So, where are you? Here. So here is a free word, uh, free form. What do you need? Money. 
money is a free form. And then he said, a word is a free form which does not consist entirely of two or more lesser free forms. In brief, a word is a minimum free form. But this is too strict, because then a compound like fire water or blood red would also be, a, uh, you know, would not be a word, but would be a phrase, right? Fire water, you can use fire as a complete utterance. You can also use water as a complete utterance. So, you know, what's, what's happening? Someone can say fire, or uh, what would you like to drink? Water, or blood, or red, or so. These are all independently uh, occurring expressions, but we don't want to say that fire, water, or blood, red are phrases. The criterion is also too loose, because many combinations that we regard as phrases would be words. So a flower, uh, or put it away, you know, you cannot simply use put uh, as an expression of its own, uh, or even put it. You know, that's in an incomplete utterance. You have to say, put it there, or put it here, or put it on the table, uh, <clears throat> and so on. So um, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you know, the in intuitively, a word is something that has some independence, and so you would think it should be uh, definable uh, as a free form, but um, act actually uh, many of the smaller items, articles uh, and prepositions and so on, are you know, as dependent as affixes uh, by this criterion. So it doesn't really work. Um, then there's the criterion of mobility uh, or fixedness, so sometimes people say, well, a word is something that can be moved around, but whose internal constituents cannot be moved around. So maybe that gets us closer to defining the word. Um, <clears throat> but well, most words have a fixed position with respect to some other words. So words are only relatively free in their ordering. So I mean, it's true. Some uh, of the notions, uh, you know, some of the, the units that are spelled with spaces around them can be moved around in some languages. For example, in, in Czech, there's a lot of word order freedom. So for Czech, this criterion works particularly well, perhaps. But there are lots of languages where it doesn't work very well at all, like English, for example. You know, English has rather rigid word order. Also, the notional noun phrase constituents almost always occur together in almost all languages. You know, so even in Czech, you, know, you cannot simply uh, you know, put any constituents of noun phrases you know, anywhere in the sentence. Um, so freedom uh, or rigidity of word order is a matter of degree. Um, so it, it intuitively it seems to work, but in many specific cases, the criterion doesn't really apply. The mobility criterion also presupposes that the different ordering is the only difference between two structures. So yesterday I saw her versus I saw her yesterday, right? So in English, there's really very little difference between these two, except that yesterday occurs at the beginning uh, in one and at the end uh, in the other. But uh, now what about uh, this case of um, Finnish um, affirmative versus negative clause? Menet in Finnish is you go, et mene is you don't go. So, so what's happening here? Would we say that te is a separate word in Finnish because it can occur either before the verb stem, uh, either after the verb stem as in minute, or before the verb stem as in et mene? Now, that's not what Finnish linguists say. They have a totally different description of the facts. They say that te is a suffix in both cases. Here it's a suffix to the verb. Here it's a suffix to the negation element. So what they would say is, yeah, we have simply two rather different constructions here. Uh, and um, they still describe both of these um, as suffixes. And, and that is the case, of course, uh, in very many instances where we have a word order alternation. So in English, uh, for example, you know, when you have a subject verb inversion, uh, you know, I. Uh, you know, you saw her versus did you see her? Um, um, 
the you occurs before the verb in one, after the verb in another, but then all kinds of things change. The verb is uh, an auxiliary verb, the other verb becomes an infinitive, and so on. So you wouldn't really say that that's word order freedom. Um, so this mobility criterion presupposes a lot of things that don't work in a lot of languages. You know, also what, what's going on here in Lithuanian? Skutu si is I shave, nesi skutu is I don't shave. Uh, what's happening here? Would we say that si is mobile uh, because it can occur after the verb here and before the verb here? Well, it's, it's unclear because people would say, no, 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 this is a suffix here and it's a prefix here, and it depends uh, on the environment. But if you can say that, then, you know, maybe yesterday is a prefix here and it's a suffix here, right? How, how, how can we exclude that? Um, so there, there actually is a lot of mobility, and um, in fact, there's also a, a big literature now about affix mobility also in the... Um, romance languages, clitic pronouns are well known to show some ordering variability. So in Italian, in the finite clauses, we have the prefixal object pronouns, melodara, versus the non-finite uh, and imperative clauses, dammelo, give it to me, where the object pronouns follow the verb. Or Spanish, quiero besarte, te quiero besarte. Uh, this element te can even move to the front uh, of the want verb. Um, but still, people have argued that the clitic pronouns are affixes. So, are they affixes that are mobile? What's, what's going on there? So, in general, mobility also doesn't work as a criterion. Then there's interruptibility. People have said, if a sequence of morphs can be interrupted, it cannot be a single word. Now, of course, sometimes you can put another affix in between. So maybe you can say, interrupted by free form. So he loves, now that's interruptible by never, for example. Uh, he never loves, and never is a free form. You know, when, when did you see her? And the answer can be never. So never is a uh, free form can occur here, so maybe that shows that he and loves are not a single word. So could a morphosyntactic word be defined as a maximal uninterruptible string of morphs? Yeah, maybe, maybe that's actually, that comes closest to a possible um, definition, but I think there are also many uninterruptible combinations that are not normally considered words. So uh, when you say very good food or both my parents, or even Kim understands it, you know, you can't really put anything between these things here. So, um, many cases of uh, combinations of word plus some other words can really be interrupted. Or uh, if they're interrupted, well, then you, one might say, well, but then uh, the word uh, combination is, so, you know, if you say, um, uh, perhaps even Kim, you know, could say even my friend Kim understands it or so, right? So you can uh, have um, uh, an apposition here. But if you would wanted to argue that even is a prefix in English, then you would say, well, it's just a prefix on the first word of the following phrase. And this brings us to the criterion of um, non-selectivity. So, People sometimes say that an affix tends to be highly selective with respect to the kinds of hosts it can combine with. But function words are able to combine with a wide range of hosts. So taking uh, some data from a lesbian, a Caucasian language that I worked on many years ago. Uh, so we have the past tense uh, suffix na, which can combine with verb stems, and only with verb stems, nothing else. But then we have the element two, which in lesbian is also spelled as a suffix, and can combine with all kinds of expressions. So bubani, that's father two, or bishini, blind two, deaf two, that means blind and deaf, guzlemishni, so it can combine with a verb stem, even wait, or kalerazazni, uh, 
also to milk cows, it combine, can combine with an infinitive, can combine with a postposition or um, kind of subordinator, also before you returned. So basically it behaves like uh, English also, um, but it's written um, as a separate element. So now if we, t if we use this criterion of uh, non-selectivity, of course, again, the question arises as to the degree of non-selectivity. So, you know, on the one hand, there are items that are very selective, that combine only with one uh, kind of part of speech, and then there are other items that are very non-selective. Then there are also all kinds of in-between elements. So, you know, when do you start saying something is a word uh, rather than an affix? And also, there are good examples of non-selective elements that are excluded from word status by other considerations. So, uh, you know, that's what I said earlier. Often the criteria for word status don't coincide. So, some authors uh, have, talking about, have talked about promiscuous inflection or edge inflection. So, that's elements like this one, which can occur on all kinds of hosts, but still are considered to be inflection uh, by the criterion uh, of um, non-separability. So the, the knee here, or non-segmentability, the knee, can be easily segmented uh, because it's this completely separate syllable and it doesn't interact uh, with the host in phonological terms or so. Um, but now what about um, the locative marker in Oko? That's the language of Nigeria. The locative marking in Oko occurs by changing the tone. So Ugbegben is mirror, and Ugbegben with a high tone on the first syllable is in the mirror. Osibina Ubo is God's house. In God's house is Osibina Ubo. So here, the first syllable gets a high tone, uh, and it's the first syllable of the whole phrase. So we have uh, an element that looks like an inflection, uh, but it's defined with respect to the phrase. So, you know, could you say that the um, high tone is a word of its own? Well, you know, since high tone is just expressed on the syllable of, uh, of some other word, normally people would say it's, you know, it's an inflectional element. You know, you, normally you wouldn't have words uh, that just consists of a high tone. Also in English, there are these um, famous cases discussed by Zwicky, children's ideas, kids' ideas, and then when you have um, uh, phrasal genitives, um, anyone who likes children's ideas, but anyone who likes kids' ideas. So uh, in English, the use of the S or the zero genitive depends on the phonology of the previous item, and Zwicky concluded that uh, this must be regarded as edge inflection. It cannot be regarded as a separate word, because otherwise you would have to say, well, the word has two allophones. One is z, the other one is zero. So there's a long discussion of this, and if we accept such markers as edge inflection, so as parts of words rather than of words as their own, then we can no longer use non-selectivity as a criterion of wordhood. Um, so, I mean, these, these things are a bit subtle, but uh, I think it's really for good reasons that there's a lot of discussion, and all of this discussion is due to the idea that, uh, you know, somehow things should line up neatly, but they don't line up, um, and uh, in, in grammars of languages, there's really no good reason to, to have words. So, you know, another criterion that has often been given, you know, I really went through, through dozens of uh, papers on word status, and people are kind of trying desperately to come up with criteria uh, to distinguish between affixes and not, so it has been claimed that bases cannot be coordinated, or in other words, that affixes cannot undergo coordination ellipses, or in still other words, that they cannot have wide scope of a coordination. So, in Italian, uh, you cannot say lo comprerà e indosserà alla festa, 
she will buy it and wear it at the party. Uh, you know, in English you could omit the it here, right? You could say she will buy and wear it at the party. So if you omit this it, then this second it sort of has scope over both verbs. But in Italian you have to repeat the law. You have to say lo comprerà e lo indosserà alla festa. And Monachesi takes that as an argument that the law has to be an affix. But in some languages such as Turkish, both inflectional and derivational affixes can be omitted under coordination. So this, in Turkish this is quite famous. You can have kedi ve köpeklerime uh, to my cats and dogs. This actually has two readings. It could be lerime, having scope over kedi ve köpek, or it could be ime, having scope over kedi ve köpler. So in the first reading, it means um, to my cats and dogs, where also the plural suffix ler has scope over cat and dog. The other one, it's only uh, the possessive im and the dative e that has scope over cat and dogs. Um, now, but it's not only the, uh, the dative suffix which has scope over both, so that, that's similar to the prepositions in the European languages. Uh, you know, in English, I don't have to say to my cats and to my dogs. Uh, but uh, also the derivational affix j can have scope over both. So supplier of sand and gravel, that's kum ve The supplier of sand would be kum ju. The supplier of gravel is chakul ju. And now this can have scope over both. You know, it's as if English allowed something like um, the, uh, uh, let's say, the driver and runner, you know, somebody who drives and runs, and then you would say the drive and runner with er having scope over both drive uh, and run. Um, so this is really curious, but in Turkish it seems to be quite normal. And then, of course, we have these derivational prefixes. In various European languages, there's quite a bit of literature on these, you know, pro-choice and gun control. So the pro has scope over both, or, or also derivational affixes. In German, you could say trink und espa. Uh, for Hungarian, this has been described by Keneshe, oito ish, abloktalan, doorless and windowless, where the less can have scope over both. So, uh, so these kinds of things are not really restricted uh, to non-affixes. Uh, or, you know, if you apply the criterion strictly, then you would have to say, okay, so pro is not a prefix, ba is not a suffix, talon is not a suffix. So, I mean, you could do that as well. Or you could also say that here this lerime is not a suffix. But, you know, you have to be consistent. And uh, linguists aren't consistent. You know, what you often see is that they try to tweak the criteria in such a way that they coincide with what is given in the spelling. And, uh, you know, I don't think that's very scientific. It's, uh, um, you know, sort of trying to prove that the spelling is right uh, or so. I mean, it, it simply seems to show to me how much we are influenced by our spelling systems. So morphophonological idiosyncrasies, that's um, also a widely discussed uh, criterion, especially uh, by Zwicky and Pullum. This, uh, by the way, Zwicky and Pullum, 1983, is the most uh, widely cited article on distinguishing between affixes and clitics. It's a very good article. Uh, it lays out a range of criteria, and it, it does this uh, quite well, and it applies it to some English cases. So, so I think it it did constitute progress because it put the question very well into focus. Um, but, uh, you know, I looked at all their criteria and incorporated them uh, in my paper, and it's, you know, the problem is we do find morphological idiosyncrasies in what by other criteria looks like host combinations. So, for example, um, in uh, some Australian languages, 
there's idiosyncrasies affecting the clitic or affix, so this, I call this just the short element. So in uh, Bijanjara, uh, the ergative marker always follows the last word of the ergative in P. So you have Tichanku, the teacher ergative, Tichipulkanku, the big child ergative. An ergative is uh, the agent case, it's a special case. Or the clever happy child, Chichinindi Pukultu. So it always comes at the end. And um, so by that criterion, it's, you know, it would be a postposition, perhaps. But then its shape is quite strictly determined by the phonology of the previous word. So, you know, we, we wouldn't normally want to say that a preposition or postposition can vary uh, so much depending on the shape um, of the immediately adjacent word of the phrase. But that's what happens uh, in Pichanchara. So we have an ku or tu. Uh, just because here this adjective pukul ends in a consonant, we have pukul tu rather than pukul ku. And such lexical conditioning is also found in Russian. And uh, I don't know, since Czech is so similar to Russian, maybe something similar is found also, found also in, uh, in Czech. You can uh, think about it. In, um, in Russian, the prepositions bez, v, is, k, nad, od, birit, bot, and c have an alternating form with o. So sometimes it's beza, vo, iza, ko. Um, so the only way to say with me is samnoi. Um, but then it's not general. It's, I mean, it, this has to do with this um, combination of consonants here. But uh, with some other nouns, mnienie, for example, is smnienjem. It's not samnienjem. So you really, you really have to learn with which words you combine which of these prepositions. So it's kind of morphologically uh, idiosyncratic. And that is really a hallmark of prefixes. So in, in Russian, some of the prepositions uh, by this criterion would rather be prefixes. Then you can also have idiosyncrasies uh, affecting the host rather than the uh, suffix. So in, in Polish, there are these floating person number markers in the past tense. So kiedy Jankowi pomogłem, when I helped uh, Janek, this M element can also go here, kiedy Jankowi pomógł, or here, kiedy Jankowi pomógł. I think this 31B example, that's rather archaic. I think it's not, not really uh, common in Polish. And the, the, the most common form, especially in the colloquial language, is this one here. So, so this nice paradigm probably applies only to older Polish. But anyway, also in older Polish, it was very clear uh, that when this element M here occurs on the verb, then it has a different shape than when it, when it occurs elsewhere, and this is a morphophonological idiosyncrasy, and um, it's, it's not the kind of non-idiosyncrasy that you would expect uh, when two separate words combine. So these idiosyncrasies uh, don't necessarily align with other criteria of word status. Same applies to this Lithuanian reflexive marker C, where we saw where was it in uh, this example 13, right? Skutuosi, nesi skutu, skutiesi, nesi skuti. So the C, when the C follows this element, then there's some phonological uh, alternations here, uh, despite the fact that the ordering is quite free. So, um, I conclude that the morphophonological idiosyncrasies also cannot be used, uh, at least not as hard and fast criteria for distinguishing uh, between words uh, and affixes, between clitics and affixes. Now, to be fair to, um, to the Zwicky and Pullen paper, they don't actually claim that the criteria that they use uh, should be uh, strictly found in all languages. They, they take them more as hints, as symptoms uh, of word status uh, 
uh, versus ethic status. Uh, but I think that's very problematic uh, because it assumes that something must be either a, a word or an affix, so that the word notion or the affix notion is pre-established, that somehow it's clear that universal grammar contains the word concept and the affix concept, right? You know, if, if these things are given in advance, if we know that we were all born with words uh, and affixes as possible categories of our languages, then that approach would work, I think. Then you can say, well, okay, so we, we don't have defining criteria, we just have diagnostics, as they call it. You know, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, doctors know that, you know, if the patient is ill, there must be some, some infection, you know, and then the doctor tries to find out by looking at some of the symptoms um, and tries to infer which of the path pathogens it is. But in language, you know, we don't actually know that words and affixes uh, exist uh, in advance. So, as a non a priorist, uh, you would say, well, if we have cross linguistic categories, um, then we have to define them in a rigorous way. So that's my approach, and you know, I, w I want basically I want to define the word as a comparative concept, so that I can then make claims. And you know, I, I don't have a good definition of word as a comparative concept. That's the basic idea. Okay. So, so some more uh, discussion. People have also said uh, that uh, words often show deviations from by uniqueness. So, uh, the, in the simplest case, we have one meaning, one form, also in morphology. So, there's plural meaning, a plural form, there's dative meaning, there's a dative form, uh, and so on. But then, now, what about all those cases where the relationship between meaning and form is a bit more complex? So people have said, actually, in morphology, we find them all over the place. Uh, we find uh, zeros, uh, zero marking, you know, like the singular zero that we talked about. Uh, yesterday, or the present tense zero, or the third singular, the third person zero. Uh, <clears throat> so, is it true that zeros are found only in morphology but not in syntax? So that when you have a zero, it's clear that it's a morphological paradigm? Well, I don't think it's clear at all. In syntax, you also have paradigms, uh, and, uh, you know, zeros sometimes mean something. So, the house, the small house, the house across the street, Tomek's house. Now, in Tomek's house, you cannot have the the here, the definite article, but you know you can very well argue that the, the definite article slot is still there. Tomek's, you know, that can't really be in the article slot because it's a phrase. So here we have a zero article, and the zero article means the same as the the elsewhere because Tomek's house is a definite noun phrase. You know, just as one uh, possible argument. I mean, when there's a zero, you can always argue, is there a zero or is there nothing? Um, so it's, um, it's, you know, my favorite simple example. Spencer has written uh, a number of papers about these questions, and he argues that in Bulgarian, uh, for instance, there's a zero uh, here in um, the re-narrated aorist, um, when you have an overt element, then the combination just has present perfect meaning. She has left. When the copula is um, not there, when there's a zero, it means she left apparently. Well, what about multiple exponents? Multiple exponents is something that morphologists have also emphasized. So an in inflection, sometimes you don't quite know which element is associated with a particular inflectional meanings. But multiple exponents is also found in syntax, in particular in periphrastic forms. So something like we have eaten or nous avons mangé. We really have, we have to look at both words in order to understand what the whole thing means. So uh, the have alone is not sufficient to give us the present perfect meaning. Also, the un of eaten is not alone to give us the present perfect meaning. Uh, 
So we cannot say that this really is the present perfect meaning and then, you know, redundantly this one occurs here. So it's really have plus n that gives us the meaning. Uh, so this is uh, multiple exponents. We have just a single meaning and uh, two forms. And it's similar also with uh, uh, prepositions and the cases they govern. So in Russian we have this preposition s, but when you hear s, you don't know what it means. It has no meaning by itself. It's only the s plus the instrumental case that gives us the meaning with. And when you have the s plus the genitive case, it gives you the meaning from. Right? So th this is just what we have uh, in inflection with multiple exponents where there's sort of two separate elements. So, so syntactic patterns can also be quite uh, irregular and uh, unexpected things can happen there. Now, what about cumulative exponents? This is another favorite um, topic uh, of uh, people who work on inflectional morphology. So cumulative exponents that inflectional morphology is uh, that, for example, the instrumental plural in Czech has the form ami, and you cannot say that one is the instrumental, one is the other plural, right? So inst instrumental plural combining one thing. Now, we have that in syntax as well. It's wiki calls it a super lexeme. So du in French, that is, stands for de and le. And of course, you cannot get du from de and le. Du is kind of just one word, but it really stands for two other words. So le château de la reine, here we have this regular form, but du is an irregular form standing for two other words. So it's cumulative exponents in syntax. Or my, um, my favorite example is uh, Tagalog. Tagalog has these um, clitic elements, which are rather regular. Ko is I, siya him. So nakita ko siya is I saw him. Um, nakita ko kayo is I saw you all. Nakita kanya is he saw you. The order is reverse, uh, even though this is the subject form, this is the object form, but it's always the short form preceding uh, the long form. So the system is fairly regular, except for when you have I and you. I saw you, it's nakita kita. Kita means I, you. So that's also cumulative exponents of, e of an even more striking case uh, than the do form. So kita, uh, is a single form, it cannot be decomposed into ko uh, plus something else. It's a single form that means I act on you. Okay, now what about morphemic patterns? Um, Mark Aronoff has written a book published in 1994 where he says the hallmark of morphology is uh, morphemic patterns. What's morphemic patterns? That's uh, markers which have no semantics, no real meaning, their only role is uh, in order to make the morphological system work somehow. So meaningless stem markers that simply have to be there for the system to work. So Aronoff talks about the Latin third stem, so for scribere, right, we have script, that's the third stem, and from this you derive all kinds of forms which have nothing in common semantically. So scriptum means written, scripturos means somebody who will write. So this is a kind of a, a perfect form. This is a future form. And you can also derive uh, forms like scriptura, which is writing uh, from it. So the t is, it has no meaning. It's, it's a form that has to be there. And, um, uh, and that's morphology by itself, as Aronoff called it. But syntax also has such forms. So, and this is something I call periphrasis form, um, because uh, you know, often when you have a periphrastic uh, tense, it's, it's sort of unclear uh, what the meaning is. Now, in in English and French, you know, these are periphrastic tenses, but you can still try to say that the n in etern has some kind of uh, meaning, right? It's also used as a participle, you know, the food eaten by us and so on, and then it's, it still makes sense to try to combine uh, these meanings, but a periphrasis form is a form that occurs in the periphrastic tense but has no other meaning. 
So in Slovene, pohvalila sem means I praised, pohvalila bom means I shall praise. Uh, now here you could say, well, this is a um, future form of be, so this is a part participle, it kind of just means I will be praising, right? But with the form sem here, this should really mean I am praising. So, you know, you sh if you got a compositional combination. But the meaning is not compositional. It's, uh, you have to know something in addition. And that hap happens more often than we think um, in syntax. So, uh, uh, and also like the inflectional classes uh, in um, morphology, Aronoff again says this is something that's typical in morphology, but we also have syntactic classes. So like auxiliary selection in French, where we have j'ai été versus je suis allé. Uh, you know, you just have to learn with every verb which auxiliary it combines with uh, in the periphrastic, um, uh, in the periphrastic tenses. So, so syntax really is very much like morphology, at least when it comes uh, to the syntax of uh, function forms. I mean, it's, it's certainly true that many of these non-standard combinations, they, they all have to do with rather tight combinations with grammatical uh, forms. And um, so, so there probably is a difference between the combination of roots, which refer to things and actions and so on. You know, you don't get these kinds of idiosyncrasies. Uh, but separating affixal markers from uh, other clitic or auxiliary forms, it's really very, very uh, difficult. And we, we should not think that the spaces that we happen to write in our languages somehow reflect some deep difference between the languages. Okay, now, so what people have done is they have, uh, you know, not looked at a single criterion, but at, at whole batteries of criteria or tests or diagnostics. Um, and then in the published accounts, they, they all point in the same direction. So, you know, when a criterion doesn't work, people usually leave it out. So, you know, these are the various criteria, and these are a couple of papers that looked at them. And you see different authors have looked at different criteria. So why didn't they look at the others? Well, maybe they pointed in a different direction. I mean, sometimes they didn't look at all of them because they simply don't apply in the language in question, or they, they are neutral, perhaps. But sometimes, perhaps, they point in opposite directions. And some authors uh, have been honest enough to note that the criteria sometimes um, disagree with each other, and then they say, well, yeah, this is, you know, this criterion could be uh, taken to point in the other direction, but I don't use this criterion. So they sometimes explicitly say that they give preference to some criterion over the other. And, uh, and that just means that, you know, people have a certain result in mind that they want to achieve, and they cherry pick their criteria in order to get the right result. And that's not very scientific, I think. It's, uh, it makes for a nice paper. These, these papers are nice to read, and you think that <laughs> after reading them, wow, nice paper, okay, I understood something, <laughs> but in fact, you don't understand anything. You've just been guided, you've just been persuaded by the author uh, to go in a certain direction. And especially for those languages where more people work on them. You know, if you have uh, somebody writing about, you know, some exotic language with a few people are working on. You saw Bicker et al. 2007. That's a paper on Tsintang, a really small language spoken by a few thousand people in Nepal. And you know, nobody else has studied this, just, just Bicker and his, his team. Or, you know, Harris has this paper on Udi, small language uh, of the Southern Caucasus. Uh, but, you know, wherever there's a language that many people have worked on, you know, there's a lot of disagreement because different people have different perspectives. Yeah, so Burias 1998 is a nice example of an honest author. <laughs>
She says, well, the behavior of elements is often not totally consistent. This means that in order to arrive at the conclusion that an element is either clitic or an affix, certain criteria must be assumed to be less crucial. Right? But which ones? You know, it's, it's, not, it's not rigorous science. Um, this is, we, we don't want to do this. We sometimes do it, but to the extent that we do this, it's, you know, we're not better than our people in the liter literature departments who uh, make subjective judgments about certain authors uh, yeah. and so on. And um, I mean, that's, that's also nice. I mean, their papers are also nice to read, but I, I think as linguists we could be more ambitious. Okay, so now, now how important is it really uh, that uh, we have the word uh, as a concept of general linguistics. Uh, and uh, wouldn't it be sufficient to have good criteria for identifying words in individual languages? In fact, this, this has been noted. So lines 968, it follows from these facts that what we call words in one language may be units of a different kind from what the words are in other languages. So if uh, the criteria don't uh, match across all languages, we may still have good definitions of words in individual languages. Yeah, sure, fine. We have lots of categories in lots of languages uh, that, that don't match. You know, I gave, I gave this example of weak and strong adjectives in German. I think yesterday it's sort of one of my favorite uh, examples. Fine, sure. But uh, if that is the case, then we should pay attention that we don't um, give the impression that uh, German and Czech, if German word and Czech word are language specific concepts, you know, we cannot say that both German and Czech have words. Uh, they just have categories that the linguists happen to call words. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're, they're really very different things. So, you know, certainly claims like all languages have words, this does not make sense on a language specific uh, view. So if, if the, the thing that we call word has a different definition in different languages, you know, then we can just say, you know, all languages have some things that some linguists have called words, but it's not an empirical claim. It's not something that, uh, that can be falsified or that's, that really is interesting. So I think all we can really say is that all languages have different degrees of tightness of minimal sign combinations. So all languages have minimal signs and they can combine them. And some of the combinations are tighter in some intuitive sense and some of the combinations are looser. When the combinations are looser, we talk about sentences. When the combinations are tighter, we often talk about words. And, and it certainly is the case that in all languages, there are some tighter combinations and some looser combinations. That seems to be uh, beyond question. So there's degree of tightness of sign combinations, but whether languages make similar uh, cuts in this degree of tightness, that's, that's quite unclear. Now, the word has also been um, regarded as a fuzzy concept by many authors. So, um, Bloomfield, many forms line, the borderline between bound forms and words, it's impossible to make a rigid distinction. Well, if, if it's impossible to make a rigid distinction, is it useful to make a distinction at all? Or is there, there just one, is it just one continuous cline, right? You know, it's, it's a little bit like, you know, is it useful to make a distinction between, uh, I don't know if Czech has something, equivalent to the German distinction between Großstadt and uh, Stadt. So in, in uh, Germany, there is a definition, I don't know who originated this, uh, of Großstadt, that's a city that has more than 100,000 inhabitants. So how many inhabitants does Olomouz have? About 100,000 or a bit more? <laughs> anyway, so, so my native city of Hildesheim, south of Hannover, um, sort of is in size roughly like all modes. And so sometimes you would read in the newspaper, okay, this year we just made it over the 100,000, so Hildesheim is a Großstadt. 
a big city, and then they were quite proud. And uh, so, of course, you, know, you can make these arbitrary divisions between categories, and you can say, okay, you know, this is a Großstadt, and then you can even say, if you're a Großstadt, then you're entitled to certain benefits, you know, then the, the federal government or the state government will, you give, will, will give you more uh, funding for something, you know, because presumably you have a bigger role to play for the uh, people who live around you, and so, and so on. So, you know, sometimes, these arbitrary distinctions are really very helpful and even necessary. Uh, but it's, of course, completely arbitrary <laughs> to say that a Großstadt, a big city, starts with 100,000 inhabitants. And so in, in linguistics, we probably don't want to have some really totally arbitrary notion of word. So, so now, now, of course, it could also be that it's not totally arbitrary, but still, um, uh, there is some um, clustering, right? So if the distribution were like this, you know, kind of really random distribution, you know, I, I would assume that the, the size of cities in Germany is sort of really like this, you know, from uh, 10,000 to uh, 3 million or so, you really get everything sort of in between. There's no tendency for uh, cities to be you know, much smaller than 100,000 or much bigger than 100,000 or so. You know, 100,000 is not any kind of uh, threshold. So, you know, if the distribution is random, then distinguishing between affixes, clitics, and independent words in this way is worthless for science, I think. But it could be that the elements that we have, they really cluster. You know, they tend to be either affixes or clitics or independent words. You know, that, I think, is a really interesting question. And uh, I think many linguists, uh, I mean, I've given this talk before to uh, different audiences, and again and again I've had the reaction that, well, you know, maybe there's all these intermediate cases, but they're rare. You know, most of the time, what we have is, you know, really these independent words or clear cases of affixes or clear cases of clitics. And then these intermediate cases, where it's not quite sure, is it an affix or a clitic, they're rare. The cases where it's not quite clear whether it's a clitic or independent word, they're also rare. So if we had this kind of clustering distribution, then maybe, uh, well, not maybe, then I think it would be justified to say, okay, affixes, clitics, independent words, these are focal uh, categories that the actual categories of languages cluster around. Uh, but I think this intuition that many people have is it's just based on the tradition. It's not based on any facts. So if somebody could show that they really cluster, I think that would be nice then. And those of us who talk about affixes, clitics, and independent words uh, would have some justification. At the moment, I think we don't have any justification. It's just, just a tradition. So what are the practical consequences? We are linguists who believe that words exist as a cross-linguistically identifiable entity to try to find ways of identifying words consistently. So if you want to con con continue talking about words, then, then you have to make an effort to justify it. If you're not committed, then you know, just stop worrying about it. You know, that's what I'm, what I'm doing. Well, and uh, in any event, you should be very careful with claims that presuppose the word concept. You should simply think critically. Okay, now, so far, uh, my talk has been rather negative uh, today, but I also want to be constructive and uh, suggest some concepts that can actually be defined. So, um, for example, we can say we have a notion of a formative. That's a minimal coherent set of phonological features that plays a role in the language system. So that's the same as a minimal sign. Then we could say a morph is a formative that bi-uniquely expresses a meaning um, we could say a construct is a contiguous set of formatives that together play a role in the language system. So we could, uh, you know, come up with some new concepts that are strictly defined. You know, it's, it's a little bit like yesterday. I talked about this concept of ditransitive construction of R and T, you know, the, the recipient and the theme. These were s specifically designed comparative concepts to make it possible to talk across a range of language. And I think in general, in comparative linguistics, that's the approach you have to take. You have to come up with new concepts, not presuppose that the old concepts will just generalize to all languages, because normally they don't, 
but come up with some new construct, uh, concepts. You know, bound and free, this can be adopted uh, from Bloomfield. I think Bloomfield was quite, quite good in creating some new concepts. So, um, so this is an approach that could be taken, and then one can move on from that and see whether some of the generalizations that have been made can be reframed uh, in these terms. So I certainly think that, for example, McWhorter, McWhorter's observation about Creoles as being simpler in some sense, there is something to it. You know, it's, it's not that it's totally off the mark. It's just expressing it in terms of morphological complexity is not the right thing. It has to be expressed in some other terms. And this is what, something that I'm working on at the moment. I, I, can't, um, I don't have any results yet, but this is the direction where I would go. I would try to create new concepts that are uh, rigorously defined and that can be applied to all languages. Okay, so syntax and morphology are ill-defined terms. Using the term morphosyntax is safer. Just word is an ill-defined term. Um, so, um, so that's uh, the conclusion of this part. And now it's uh, about 11, right? So we would have another 15 minutes. But maybe you have some questions or objections. Yeah. Yeah, so, so when people talk about word order, what they generally mean is the order between uh, verb and object, uh, or verb and subject, or subject and object, or um, adjective and the noun it modifies, or maybe an adposition, um, and so on. So, well, maybe we, last, last night we had a discussion about constituent structure versus uh, dependency structure. And, uh, you know, I noted that uh, the Prague Dependency Tree Bank is the greatest contribution of Czech linguistics. It's really very widely used outside Czechia. Um, so dependency structure, especially in Czechia, is something that should also be taken uh, very seriously. So, um, and, you know, I think the popularity of constituent structure really comes from English, because in English the word order is more rigid, um, and in Czech it's, uh, it's uh, less rigid. But uh, the, uh, the main point is that, um, of course, if I don't have a word notion, I cannot have a word order notion, right? Um, so I think what I would uh, talk about is... Uh, you know, and that really works for cross-linguistic purposes. Uh, we can talk about root order. So what's a root? A root is something that can be really quite readily identified across languages. A root uh, is um, a morph, that is a formative that bi-uniquely expresses a meaning that refers to an action, uh, or to a thing or to a property, right? It's really very readily identifiable across all languages. Uh, you know, actions like run or, or hit uh, uh, or wash or so, you know, it's e really easy to find uh, roots in all languages corresponding to such um, actions. And also, you know, things like, uh, you know, trees and houses and stones and and the moon and so on. It's also very easy. And also properties like a good uh, and bad and uh, you know, even heavy and wet uh, and so on, they're also easy to identify across languages. There's, there's no issues there. And then the question is, you know, how are these ordered? You know, in all languages, you can say something like a heavy stone. So, so where does the property root go with respect 
uh, to the thing root. In all languages, you can say, um, you know, they, they ate the hot soup. You know, where does the hot soup go with respect to the eat uh, root and so on. So, um, I mean, colloquially, I still continue to talk about word order, but when people ask me, then I say, well, what I really mean there is root order. And, uh, and then, of course, sometimes people are interested not only in root order, but also how it correlates with uh, the order of non-root morphemes. Uh, so morphemes that refer to you know, various ancillary, or morphemes that express various ancillary meanings, such as you know, add positions, uh, cases, tense aspect markers, negation markers, and so on. That also occur in all languages, but they're not roots because they don't express things, actions, uh, and properties. So, um, so in this comparative perspective, I mean, it's, it's rather unusual. Uh, you know, nobody, nobody talks like, like I do, but I think we should really talk like that. And if we do, then we um, can quite readily do comparative linguistics. Yes? I said that, and, right? And the kinds of, uh, the kinds of uh, units that you have here in 43 are very close to the kinds of units that people are expecting in uh, distributed morphology. And not just distributed morphology, but the debate between distributed morphology and the so called uh, nano syntax approach or uh, cartographic style approaches. Uh, but all of these uh, developments have in common that they don't. Right, I said that at the beginning. When you say that nobody's talking about you about words, I can't agree with that. There's many, many people that are talking just like this. Well, yeah, in uh, uh, distributed morphology and nanosyntax circles, yes. But those are sort of fairly restricted, found mostly in Tromsø and uh, Ghent and... Uh, Right, I said that. So I, and I said that also the lexicalism was the mainstream view of the 1980s and 1990s, but now it's not the mainstream view. So that what I said here actually is the mainstream view uh, in um, you know minim minimalist uh, distributed morphology generative uh, grammar. But still, you know, we have these kinds of claims, you know, by people like uh, McWhorter and Sampson and Klein and Purdue and so. So you know, the distributed morphology and minimalism. Uh, camp has not had a significant impact outside of this camp uh, somehow you know so the, the thinking of people uh, you know outside of this relatively narrow group uh, of linguists has not been affected so you you uh, you know should welcome the fact that you know I coming from a rather different community of linguists that what I'm saying is converging with uh, what the minimalists and distributed morphologists uh, are saying, so you know, you can say that's a, a positive development, but uh, I'm uh, kind of in a way more ambitious, you know, the distributed morphologists, you know, they write highly technical papers that I find very hard to understand, and uh, you know, even though I've often tried, you know, I've, I've written a morphology textbook and so on, so I know a lot about morphology, but it's, it's kind of arcane, and it's kind of inward looking, uh, and so it, it cannot really have uh, a strong impact on what's happening outside these narrow circles. And, you know, I'm, I'm rather trying to have a sort of a bigger impact on larger group uh, of linguists. Yeah. I think I can 
Um, I think the comparative concepts that the comparative linguists use uh, are uh, measures and they're not, they don't correspond to things uh, that are somehow in our head. You know, if you, you know coming from generative grammar, uh, like uh, you do and you do and, and you do, you know, you probably expect uh, the, the categories that linguists work with to be reflected or not to reflect some mental entities, uh, something about universal grammar or so. Uh, <clears throat> you know, just like, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, the phys physicists, uh, uh, you know, f work with notions like uh, gravity or waves or so, you know, they, cor they, they expect gravity and waves to correspond to something in reality. But I think that the comparative concepts that uh, comparative linguists uh, you know, like in the word atlas of language structures and so on, so in my work, they work with, they correspond more to, uh, to the measure. So physicists also have concepts like meter or liter or kilogram uh, and so on. And these are uh, really arbitrary, you know, you know, like this measure of 100,000 inhabitants for a, a, a big city or so. So um, I don't think, I mean, I, I'm not sure if that was your question, but uh, I don't think that uh, our concepts necessarily have to uh, correspond to some discontinuities in the actual data. But uh, when our concepts are presented as showing discontinuities, they, they should correspond to real discontinuities. That, that's, that's the idea that I have. And I think that we should be very critical about traditional concepts. Uh, so I think it's, uh, you know, if I define uh, a formative or morph or construct in this way, these are non-traditional concepts, and there's a much greater chance uh, that they will uh, stand up to further scrutiny, simply because these were specifically designed for comparison, so that they maybe really correspond to discontinuities. It's, it's not necessary, but it's a, it's a much... Uh, greater chance, whereas, uh, you know, a concept such as word, uh, I, I think the problem really is that it's based on our intuitions about spelling. And why do we have spaces uh, in spelling? You know, it's, it's not because of anything in language structure, because it has to do with readability. So, you know, I think spaces arose in uh, our writing system as people had more and more access to reading, and, you know, reading was became cheaper and cheaper or more and more widespread, and people realized that if they put spaces somewhere, in, in some places, then it's simply easier to read the text. So I don't, I don't, I think there isn't more than that, and there's nothing really in language structure that uh, corresponds to that. But there are some discontinuities in language structure, and uh, our comparative concepts had better correspond to these uh, continuities. But it's not strictly necessary. What is, what is the specific problem, you know, comparing Czech and English? I mean, Czech and English are not 
such different languages, right? They're, they're rather similar in so many ways. Uh, but most people would say that in Czech, uh, the order of the major constituents, or equivalently, the order of the roots, uh, is um, determined by information structure. So that you can, for example, when you have a verb with two objects, uh, um, you know, Czech could have recipient, theme, verb, subject order, right? Which is totally impossible in English. Uh, in English, the, the only thing you can do is move one object to the front of the subject. So something like, to my sister, I gave the money or so. Whereas in Czech, you could have something like, to my sister, the money gave I, uh, perhaps. I mean, that would be also rather unusual, I think. Uh, but uh, anyway, so in Czech, uh, the word order or root order or constituent order is determined by information structure in English. Uh, it's determined um, by um, yeah uh, non-information structure grammatical patterns. I, I w wouldn't quite know how to uh, describe it. Uh, um, you know, certainly, simply saying syntactic versus non-syntactic or so is is not really good because syntax is just. Uh, a word for uh, the rules for combining the morphs uh, and in particular the roots and so on so but but i don't really see a problem there I mean, it's, it's interesting to ask uh, to what extent there are correlations. You know, as a typologist, I'm, uh, I'm always, you know, interested in questions such as, you know, is it the case that because the Czech uh, thing roots uh, tend to have uh, kind of lots of uh, markings, flags at the end, which indicate things like accusative, dative, uh, even nominative and so on, does that perhaps correlate with the fact that the order can be shifted around more freely. Whereas in English, it's, you know, we also have these prepositions like to and for and at and so on, but they're not as frequent as these little case markers in Czech. So, you know, could there be a correlation there? And uh, I think that has been shown. So, you know, losing, using a, a sample of hundreds of languages uh, fairly recently, um, the Finnish linguist, um, uh, What's, what's his name? Um, no, some other name escapes me. But anyway, a young Finnish typologist has looked at 500 languages or even more and has determined that uh, there really is a correspondence. If the language uses accusative marking for the patient, then it tends to have freer word order or it tends to have SOV order, whereas if the language has no accusative marking, then it tends to has, have SVO marking. That, for a long time, that wasn't very clear because there are counterexamples sort of in both ways, um, but it, it really does seem to be uh, that there is such a tendency. And it's these kinds of questions that I found, find interesting, and I don't need any word notion for them. I can do everything with roots and markers uh, and uh, you know, other kinds of... Uh, affixes. Okay, now I think we need to stop, but I thank you also for the discussion and uh, for a very pleasant time here in Olomouc. Thank you. Thank you.